oh, don't worry. I ain't dead yet. I still gotta tell the internet why it's wrong all the time. Before we begin today's video, I'd like to do the usual legal clarification that we will be talking about emulation. But even so, in the contents of this script, I am not displaying any direct advocacy for piracy. Emulation and piracy are not the same thing, and everything I say here is in the interest of preservation and archival, which is also accomplished using the legally obtained material you own. And with that, Let's get started. On the 22nd of March 2021, news outlet The Gamer disclosed that the PlayStation Store on PS3 and PSP will be permanently closing in July 2021, with the PS Vita Store following soon after in August of the same year. It was also soon after that I received an email from PlayStation on the 29th of March announcing that this, yeah, this was all very much the case. For exact dates, the PS3 Store will close on the 2nd of July. The PSP Store, while partially closed in 2016, will have a full closure on the same day, preventing you from even buying DLC, and the PS Vita store will be following after on the 27th of August. Alongside the announcement, the webpage versions of the stores got shut down, meaning the only way to access them for the last few months of their life cycle is via the consoles themselves. And the announcement was so abrupt and last minute that developers weren't even informed about it in advance. They found out the exact same time as everyone else, leading to situations like an indie developer that had to cancel the PS Vita port of their digital title because it wouldn't be finished in time, let alone make sales before the closure. From hearing this news, I'm here making a nice, quick, informative video on things you should know and take away from the subject at hand, because it made my inner game preservationist have an immediate stroke. I'm hearing really misinformed takes online, like, this is why you only buy physical. Why would anyone want to buy games from decade-old systems? At least you can re-download the games you own, stop complaining. And my personal favourite, there goes the most accessible way to play Persona 3. It's not. Simply put, everyone on the internet is wrong, and I wanted to put myself on a pedestal like I always do, because I don't think we get the full scope of the situation or how to resolve it. So first topic of the day, what does the closure mean? Now, to some degree, this is a new topic to talk about. Speaking personally, I'm relatively young in the world of games, as it wasn't until late in the seventh generation of consoles at about 2013 that I started buying my own games, being actively involved in the discussion of games, and thinking about what I was consuming. Side note, 13-year-old Joey, he was an asshole, you wouldn't have liked him. The seventh generation was kind of an originator in the ecosystem of downloadable console titles, it wasn't exactly new, and this was something that was done on other platforms for years, albeit somewhat primitive. But this was an early instance of a constantly running storefront where you could purchase and download game software and additional content for your games as the primary function of the system. As in, most of the audience could use their console and go digital only while still getting consistent support, exclusives, and a sizable library. This is made apparent by the PS3 Essentials Collection, where you can buy digital copies of some of the most popular physical release PS3 games at a heavily discounted price. Price. Or as a newer example, I don't like holding and swapping cartridges, which is why my Nintendo Switch has a 100% digital library, because I usually play games by frequently jumping back and forth between them, rather than just binging one, and I don't like waiting on shipping. Basically... Basically, I'm monkey. <laughs> Basically, a digital console gaming ecosystem may have been normalized, but it's still young considering this situation of a full-on platform closure is something not too many of us are kept up with or even considered as a possibility long term. We haven't experienced it all that frequently, except for the closure of the Wii Shop channel, so it's a somewhat new zone of discussion. So, I wanted to spread across my limited knowledge of it all because, don't get it twisted, this is something we're going to be dealing with console generation after console generation, no matter how much you prepare, unless some big sweeping changes are made. What the shutdown of what I'll be calling in this video the legacy PlayStation Store means is no longer being able to purchase new copies of digital games for these three platforms. All that's going to be left for purchase is whatever is playable on PS4 and PS5, but it also means a series of other discontinuations. DLC, for instance, even of games with physical releases, will no longer be available unless you can find a physical copy of that game with the DLC bundled on the disc, meaning even chunks of the physical media you own are going to be lost to time in a couple of months. This whole scenario could also mean that we're close to the potential closure of Sony's online support for the platforms, period, as shown by the decision to discontinue not just the store, but the messaging and streaming services of those platforms. All this has a series of knock-on effects, and I'm not just talking about not being able to play a few online games or missing out on a few trophies. Supposedly, you will be able to re-download games and DLC you already own, but it raises the question of for how long. And according to accounts from news sites and other players, this could also mean the platforms will eventually stop distributing necessary patches and updates for out 
out of date titles and hardware. So for instance, if there's a PS3 game with an unavoidable game breaking bug that got patched out, that game will only be playable on systems that happen to download that patch while it was up. What I'm trying to convey here is that this is more than just not being able to buy or play a few games like the closure of the Wii Shop channel. We've reached the point of console gaming where online connectivity is so ingrained into the infrastructure and consoles are already such a short term and disposable line of hardware compared to PCs that this closure can cause collateral damage to the preservation and usability of an entire platform of media. And that is terrifying. If you don't believe me, then here's a fun fact. The PS3 has a kernel clock. For those who aren't tech savvy, and hell I sure as shit ain't, it's basically a chunk inside the console's infrastructure that keeps track of the date and time and keeps all the hardware and software in sync with each other. This is how it gets the date right even if you have the system off and stuff like that. Because of this little shit, every single PS3 is basically an ephemeral ticking time bomb. The battery will inevitably break, controllers will stop connecting, digital games won't boot because of an OS error that prevents it from syncing your purchase licenses, the firmware will probably reset, it's a complete mess. So the common fix is to replace or clean the battery and give the console a second to resync with Sony servers to get everything back into working order. In due time, that fix might be gone forever, so even if you're rushing to re-download all of your games and purchase everything you can right now, it's still not a guarantee that everything will be safe for decades to come because Sony like making short-lived paperweights. And if you think that's a strictly digital problem, it's even worse on PS4 as shown by the the fact that people's PS4s have already had CMOS battery errors and it meant their PS4s couldn't even install or boot physical games. So again, this isn't a one-time issue, games preservation isn't a download exclusive issue, and this is something we're going to be dealing with on Sony's consoles for the foreseeable future even if you're a nut for physical games. And you may have stacks on stacks of physical discs lining your shelves, hell, I do too, because the core of being a gaming YouTuber is conveying the guise of your gamer status to make your audience think your points have an intellectual basis built on consumption. See? I own Goldeneye and Banjo-Kazooie, and they're both shit. But acting like physical games on legitimate hardware is the only way to go, like it's some sacred bastion for preservation, is short-sighted and literally incorrect. Discs are a limited supply unlike digital games which can be copied over and over, and the legitimate hardware that can play those discs will soon fade into dust as they implode on their time bomb hardware. Demonizing digital games in your physical elitism when both maintain an equilibrium of pros and cons does literally fucking nothing. Thing. It's not a long-term fix, it's just a temporary extension of the short term because it gives you the illusion of ownership and comfort. I'm gonna be real here, if you tell someone the solution to the store closure is to track down a PS3 that doesn't have a decade-old hardware problem and pin down a physical copy of a game on eBay because Sony arbitrarily decided to make digital units no longer available, you're a cunt. Console gaming historically has an allergy to preservation, but it's not a new allergy that came from overindulging in online services. It's been a constant issue that's been around ever since we started slotting in cartridges because console gaming ecosystems are fundamentally predatory, short-term and overprotective walled gardens with needless restrictions on what the user can or can't do with their own property. You know how music is piss easy to archive? It's because you don't need to get your mitts on a super specific CD player to keep the tunes alive. What I'm basically saying is emulation has been around longer than the PS3 for a reason. It's not just for cheapskates who like piracy. Why do you think even retro systems that don't connect to the internet have emulation? Which leads me to the most important part of my PSA. Emulation? It's way easier than you remember. The closure of the legacy PlayStation Store means we'll be losing the ability to purchase digital titles from the PS1, PS2, PSP, PS3, and PS Vita. But out of those five platforms, three have pretty much been perfected and one is well on its way to perfection. Most emulators for PS1, PS2, and PSP at this point are as simple as downloading the program and hitting play. Depending on the emulator, you might need to track down a BIOS file, which is essentially a file that contains the internal software infrastructure of the console so that downloading the emulator is still technically legal. But after a single YouTube tutorial, you can play those games like it's nothing. Losing those titles by the store closure just feels like a minor inconvenience due to the advancements made in the past, and I firmly believe it's the least of our worries. Console manufacturers did not make good enough failsafes to ensure this media is still accessible legitimately, as shown by this quote from Jim Ryan, president and CEO of SIE, where he pretty much lays bare that he has zero interest in backwards compatibility because he doesn't think Gran Turismo 1 
one is very good. As if we should start burning Jules Verne novels the moment the pages start creasing. So with the legacy store closure, I wanted to beg every last one of you to support efforts for emulation of 7th gen platforms to account for even digital titles, online play, patches, and even DLC in order to preserve as much as we can. PS3 emulation is well underway with emulators like RPCS3 to the point of its current state being super accessible, provided your computer is powerful enough to run it. And even then, if you have a computer that can run a few PC games from the last decade, I'm certain it will be able to run games from the late 2000s at 720p 30fps just fine. Playing PS3 games on your PC is as easy as downloading and installing the emulator, downloading a PS3 firmware update from Sony for the emulator to use, and booting up a game that's on your hard drive, with tutorials on how to dump both physical and digital games straight from your PS3 so they can sit comfy on your PC or cloud storage. Basically, the Persona 5 PC port is here, it is real, but you should just boot up your PS2 emulator instead and play P3 Fest because it's the superior game anyway. Now of course there are some holdups, like not every PS3 game being supported at the moment, but even so, the fact that there's a comprehensive list of which games are currently supported, with instructions on how to use your legally owned copies, including digital games, and in a community to exchange information with, RPCS3 represents why I love emulation so much, because it quells my fears of the future by making sure historical media will still be accessible in full long after the official support fades away. And on the subject of official support fading away, this was planned to be the section where I listed out a series of games you might want to look into before the shutdown, but I decided that instead it might be better to round off the think piece portion of this video in one go and get to the list later. It was in noting down all the vastly unique titles that were up for grabs that I realized I wanted the core of this video's message to be seen without a random list clogging up the middle that you would click away from, so we're gonna be weird and jump to this video's outro now and then jump back to my recommendations after. So. Over the course of all this, one might ask the question of why? Like, why feel so passionately angry about this whole situation? Why act like the sky is falling? Why treat this as some weird, important lesson that needs to be learned about the media we consume? Well. I can only answer that with a personal anecdote. You don't need me to tell you that the current year of this video is 2021. That's all well and good. Over the course of a year, games come and go. They launch, people play them, then we move on to something else. We talk, we argue, we recommend, we scream, we cry, ready to start it all over again when the next shiny thing releases that ebbs and flows in and out of commonplace conversation. So with that I ask you, what do you think has been my favourite game to play during 2021 thus far? What would would you say would be my 2021 game of the year, if you want to put it that way? Well, it's obvious. Clock Tower 3 for the PlayStation 2, a 2003 survival horror game by film director Kinji Fukasaku that has you assume the role of a British schoolgirl who discovers she comes from a long line of demon hunters, so travels back in time to combat serial killers and put the spirits of their victims at peace. The game was a critical and commercial failure, being criticised for its repetitive gameplay and short length, and was only able to shift 122,000 units in the space of a year. But even by today's survival horror standards, it's unlike anything else I've played. From from the unpredictable enemy AI, to the ridiculously charming cutscenes, to Alyssa Hamilton becoming my favourite female protagonist in anything, being a scared and helpless 14 year old girl who's still self driven and motivated to carry out her duty and save her mother no matter how much she puts herself in harm's way, effectively making her a badass without losing a drop of emotional agency. And the very first time I heard about this game, let alone played it, was just a few months ago during 2021 to which I played it on my PC using PCSX2. As a matter of fact, most of my legitimate hardware has kicked the bucket. Physical games are hard to come by, all my discs have simply stopped working because PS1 and PS2 discs break if you do so much as look at them. So emulation is where I first played a ton of my all-time favourites, like Persona 3 Fess and Metal Gear Solid. This is gonna sound like a weird take, but I'm just gonna out and say it. Video games never age. The expectations of a target audience? That changes with age. The hardware games can run on, that changes with age. The critical lens with which we evaluate games, that changes with age. But the games themselves, their writing, their mechanical design, their artistic direction, I don't think any of that ages. I think it's just different. And I can say with firm confidence that there are even games from the late 90s and early 2000s that while old can still flex on a lot of today's games any day of the week. Games like Thief the Dark Project, System Shock 2, and any Fallout game that wasn't made by Bethesda 
straight up put modern day games in similar genres to shame, with the amount of depth that comes from their mechanical responses to the player's actions and the quality of their writing, in a way that even when playing on game engines that are decades old or dealing with clunky movement controls, the true core of the experience made by people with ideas isn't taken away, no matter how primitive the work is. Especially on consoles, games are an outlier in how artistic and historical media is treated long term, because we see games as being arbitrarily different to other media on a contradictory level, because we don't know how to talk about them or perceive them. We say games are art, until we turn around and say they need to be fun to be good. We naturally converge on and give a spotlight to the games that speak to us the most as people, only to say games are escapism that only exists for entertainment or to kill time. We frequently talk about how games function as products in a capitalist system, only to then say they aren't political. And we give value to the random bits of trivia about development periods and gamer culture, only to then say games are not historical media in the same vein as a diary or a painting, because we think games function in a bubble for some reason. While we may have many reliable sources to keep track of books, films, and TV broadcasts, video games are fated in the current system to be more perishable due to a more juvenile and uncaring audience that doesn't acknowledge what the media in front of them entails, and companies that see that audience and think they won't care in the name of capital. And I'm being serious when I say that I don't think there's a single video game in existence that is worthless enough to warrant being permanently lost to time and not be accessible to everyone. Every game has a story be it the one spoon-fed to you cutscene to cutscene, or a story about experimental ideas, industry turmoil, national history, or one person's creative journey. And this is something that sprung to life for me, because this is the very first instance in the game industry where a platform I forged a bond with is soon going to fade into time. And I want to keep as much preserved as possible, not just because I don't know how to let go, but because I can't help but think about someone in the coming decades who finds their own Clock Tower 3, who downloads a PS3 game from 2012 onto their computer with a casual air and walks away from it feeling like no other games from the year 2042 compare to it. And that's why I wanted to make this video, because when this closure approaches, I want all of you to try and think more critically about the security of the media you currently own. If the day will come where you can successfully retrieve it within the next decade, no questions asked, and reconciling the fact that this might be something we'll have to deal with generation after generation because of how commercially we perceive games as a platform of media. And it won't be long until the inevitable news article about the PS4 and PS5 PlayStation Store closing its doors and seeing more releases fade away. All I hope is to get you thinking about it. So I want to thank you for listening nonetheless. And with that, games you might want to look into before the shutdown. First off, the digital onlys you might want to look into are The Last Guy, a PS3 digital exclusive title by Sony's Japan Studio, where you navigate a series of Google Earth mazes to save a conga line of civilians and avoid monsters that are ravaging the world. The game's very fun, very charming, very cheap, and the PS3 store is literally the only place you can get it. Next, Echochrome and Echochrome 2, again by one of Sony's small teams that involves manipulating perspective to solve a series of puzzles. The first game having you rotate MC Escher inspired structures to escort a mannequin, and the second game using the PlayStation Move to control shadows that create platforms. The only physical entry in this series that exists is the PSP version of the first game, unless you import from Japan, so if you want to get the other two on PS3, now's your chance. Next, Infamous Festival of Blood. This is a standalone spin-off of Sucker Punch's Infamous 2, set in a spoof reality where Cole McGrath becomes a vampire, offering a new set of missions and powers. The second game is my personal favourite in the series, so for me, I feel like you can't go wrong with more of it. Next, Nobi Nobi Boy, an experimental title by Katamari Damacy and Watam creator Keita Takahashi. The game has you spawn as a worm-like creature called Boy, you stretch, and that's literally the entire game, I'm not kidding. Do I recommend this game explicitly to have a good time? Not really, but its very presence combined with the community features the game had in its heyday made me believe it's still worth keeping on hand. Next, The House of the Dead 4, because shout out to my House of the Dead stands. how about that first game remake? I am so fucking excited. House of the Dead is just the ultimate go-to for stupid, campy arcade horror action, but did you know that unlike the other games, which are basically drowning in re-releases, the PS3 Digital exclusive release of The House of the Dead 4 is 
is literally the only home release it ever had. I don't get why, because it's also my favourite. The introduction of larger zombie hordes and rapid fire SMGs gives it such a different dynamic where you start prioritising accuracy and scoring over just blasting away the first thing you see. As well as being a follow-up to the Goldman arc that's loaded with House of the Dead 2 references, and it's bundled with the stages from the House of the Dead 4 special, a spin-off arcade game that had you sit in a spinning chair while shooting at two different displays. That and G is a playable character in the special missions, and in true House of the Dead nature, G has a completely different appearance and voice actor. I love this stupid series so much. So like I said, if you're into this series and want to give this one a shot, the digital PS3 port is the only legitimate way you can purchase and play the game without tracking down an arcade machine, especially if you want to try the special stages. Next, a double bill with Plastic's PS3 demo scenes, Linger in Shadows and Detura. Plastic are a Polish development team that, in their own words, make not games, but demo scenes, pieces of interactive digital art that simply take advantage of the hardware and input methods provided by the game system. Linger in Shadows is a six minute short film that takes you through a series of psychedelic visuals while encouraging you to find areas of the scene that are interactable, like turning the camera with the gyro controls or rotating structures with the analog stick. While Detura is a more conventional walking simulator type adventure game that has you explore a forest by touching objects in order to solve puzzles. Simply put, I'm not gonna sit here and act like these games are great, but fact of the matter is the game industry and how we discuss games has changed drastically since these two titles came out. So I prefer if they were still floating around in some way, shape or form so that players can take a look at them and discuss further from there because they are interesting at the very least. And my final recommendation for the digital exclusives is more of a plea. Please buy Tokyo Jungle. It's genuinely one of the best games on the PS3. I am not kidding. For those who don't know, Tokyo Jungle is another case of Sony grabbing up a small team and throwing money at them to make a digital exclusive. It's almost a roguelike survival game where you assume the role of an animal in 21st century Tokyo after all the humans mysteriously disappear, and you have to hunt other animals and clear objectives to build your stats and survive for as long as you can. Initially, there doesn't seem to be that much to it, but once it clicks, it really clicks. You start figuring out the movement tech, animation cancels, advanced strategies, all to try and reach as high up in the leaderboard as you can, along with the local co-op mode where you and another person can do a run simultaneously as completely different animals. It is a genuinely unique hidden gem on the PS3, and its only physical release was in Japan, so if you get anything on the store, this is my personal highest recommendation, including the DLC, where you can get additional animals for less than a dollar that have their own stat pools that drastically affect how you approach a run. I think it costs like three dollars, if not less, to get all of the DLC in this game. And that's what I got in terms of games that will soon be gone after the store closure, letting us move on to the honourable mentions of games which have physical releases, but I recommend grabbing anyway just so you're not spending more than you need to pinning down a physical copy. Which consists of the Hatsune Miku Project Diva games, namely FNF Second, which I've mentioned frequently on this channel as two of the greatest rhythm games ever made, Persona 4 Dancing All Night, which I may have gone on record before saying it's not one of my favourite rhythm games, but if you've been planning to get it soon, the only way to get it after the closure will be either tracking down a physical copy on Vita or getting the PS4 version as an exclusive bonus in an overpriced bundle that comes with 3 and 5 dancing. Siren Blood Curse, a cult classic episodic survival horror that has you locating and avoiding intelligent zombie-like creatures by possessing their line of sight as you stealth around, and Little Big Planet 2, believe it or not, which is honestly one of my favourite platformers. And you may be thinking, hang on, Joey, isn't Little Big Planet one of Sony's largest properties right now? Well, yes, because to be exact, I mean the DLC stages that incorporate a whole bunch of cute experimental mechanics, from the move pack that lets you make motion control gadgets, or the cross controller pack which uses the PS Vita as a Wii U-like second screen to control elements around the stage. Basically, if you get around to Little Big Planet 2, either pick up the DLC stages while you still can, or get a copy with the extras edition where everything comes pre-installed. To which we top off with what I call the levity round, a small group of games that used to be exclusive to the systems, but have now since found releases on other systems that everyone probably didn't know about, letting us take a deep breath knowing they'll still be accessible for now. These being Gravity Rush, a zero gravity action adventure game with gorgeous visuals which used to be a PS Vita exclusive until it found its way to being remastered on PS4 and getting a sequel. Next, The Unfinished Swan, genuinely one of my most cherished games of all time and a PS3 hidden gem by Edith Finch developers Giant Sparrow. This game has you explore an abandoned kingdom armed with only 
a paintbrush as you unravel a story about the anxiety of establishing an artistic legacy. The game used to be exclusive on the PS3 store, but not only did it eventually get ported on the PS Vita and PS4, but you can even get the game on iOS and Steam now, which has me overjoyed beyond belief. This game is genuinely fucking good, guys. Please buy it. Next, Persona 4 Golden, the expanded edition of Atlas's Persona 4 on the PS2, which was once a Vita exclusive, but has now found its way onto Steam, which I highly recommend, as it still stands as the second best game in the Hashino era series in my book. And to finish it all off, Sound Shapes. Sound Shapes is a PS3 and PS Vita game that then found its way onto PS4, a platformer where you assume control of an adhesive blob, collect coins that add notes and loops to the background music, and then avoid a series of enemies and obstacles that behave in rhythm to the music of the stage. With five albums containing music and visuals by completely different artists, from I Am Robot and Proud, to Beck, to an actual homophobe, Sound Shapes is an atmospheric masterpiece that just feels good to play from beginning to end with a surprising amount of replay value. The main reason I'm giving it a spotlight in this video is because while it may be safe on the PS4, that's only for now. And when the day eventually comes that we need to think about archiving the PS4 and PS5's library, I want to hope that this game will eventually be carried down rather than forgotten. So that's your lot for today. I've been Joey, and I want to just thank you all and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you when I see you.